tremendous honor for me to, uh, to be here and have a, an introduction by Professor Tarr and speaking from the audience. Uh, no, no, I'm enjoying my uh, so We'll see how that works out. Uh, so I changed a little bit the title. Uh, it's logical. Uh, it's logic automata. <laughs> it's logic automata and algebra, so so that it wouldn't sound like a, a company selling towers. And uh, so uh, this talk will be about some things which involve these three topics. And uh, it will not be about all of logic. It will may maybe be all about all automata. I mean. I mean, you won't learn everything about automata, but this is, but and it certainly will not be about all of algebra. So in particular, here when I say algebra, it will be mainly things like monoids and maybe universal algebra, so that kind of algebra. But of course, the main point of interest is this red circle, which is, you know, how they mix up. And uh, I would, uh, what I would hope to do in this talk is, uh, to present some mainly classical results, much of them up to 60 years old, or more than 60 years old. And, uh, uh, but I would like you to have a feeling of what is the kind of topic here, and uh, with less of an emphasis on current research, uh, but just to, to explain what are the connections. Okay, so I will start off by explaining what kind of logic what is the particular type of logic that this talk is about? So let's go to, to logic. And uh, so first, uh, and, uh, the first type of example of logics, and this is essentially a non-example, it's not what I'm going to be talking about. Suppose that you want to uh, describe the set of graphs which contain a triangle. One way you could do it is, you know, for, for instance, you want to, you could write an algorithm which inputs a graph and you know there's a for loop or something and test if it contains a triangle. But another way to do it is to express this property in the language of logic. So I hope this formula is right. It's very difficult to write formulas which are correct. Uh, so you would say that there exists a vertex X, exists a vertex Y, and exists a vertex Z, such that they are pairwise connected and therefore form a triangle. So you could write this in the language of logic. Now the idea of using formal logic, like quantifiers and stuff, to, to express properties in computer science, I think it's called database theory. And uh, uh, this has been tremendously successful. I think, so I would guess that, I don't know, maybe Fokion has a better idea on the profits <laughs> uh, gained by writing formulas like this. But I will, you know, take a number out of my finger. Let's say $60 billion gained by this idea <laughs> for no good reason. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it has been incredibly influential. And I, I, as far as I understand, it originated not far from here in, uh, in Almaden. Is that correct? In San Jose. In San Jose. Uh, so that's one type of logic. So you use formulas. And this is all the examples are going to be like this. But I will be changing the types of logics uh, subtly until I get to the one that I will actually be talking about. So uh, let's have another property also of graphs because this is an intuitive model. Uh, maybe uh, let's forget that. Uh, let's talk about graphs which are three colorable. So if you naively formalize the definition of three colorability using logic, uh, and <laughs> you can't do it much better, uh, is you would say this way. There exist three sets of vertices, red, green, and blue. Now, in my previous example, the quantifiers would range over elements of the graph, so vertices. Now they range over sets of elements. Uh, exist three sets of vertices, and then you say that you know it's a free coloring. So what you have to say is something like uh, every vertex has a color. So for every vertex x is either red, green, or blue. And then you want to say that every edge has endpoints with different colors, and you know you write some quantifiers which say that. So that's another example of a formula. This time, as you can see, apart from quantifying over elements of the structure, so vertices, I can quantify also over sets of elements. So this is something called higher order logic, so second order logic. And this is also, uh, this is a logic that is 
uh, close to the interests uh, to the topic of this particular talk. So, for example, a classical result is Fagan's theorem, which says that if you manage to express a property of graphs in a uh, using a formula similar to this one, then it's going to be NP, and that's if and only if. So what does it say? It says that a property of graphs, but it's not really about graphs, it could be about words or about anything, is in NP, if and only if you can ex define it in something called existential second order logic. So what's existential second order logic? It's formulas like this. What does that mean? That means that you first have quantifiers which are existential only, but they can range over sets of elements, or you could also have sets of pairs of elements and so on. So you have, these are the so-called second order quantifiers because they range not over individual elements, but sets of elements, or possibly sets of pairs. And then inside here, you use only first order logic, which means you can only quantify over uh, individual elements, but you're allowed to use negation. So for example, I don't know, the universal quantifier and you could mix it with the existential one and stuff like that. So that's, uh, this is what's called existential second order logic and it captures exactly the class NP. So you could imagine that maybe you could prove that P is equal to not, an, no, an, uh, not equal to NP by, you know, using this somehow, uh, or, or not, <laughs> uh, or uh, prove different things about NP, maybe not this particular one, but that has not been entirely successful. Uh, so that's another type of logic. So you can use basic first order logic and you can use uh, second order logics, but this talk is not really about that. So that's, uh, but it's close. Uh, so uh, uh, I am typically going to be in this talk interested in finite models, although I will mention infinite models at some point. And for example, uh, here you will have things like, this is connected to something called algorithmic method theorems, and you have theorems which say that if you can express a property in some logic, then you can do it by an algorithm of a certain type. Fagan's theorem is an example, but you can have better examples which are actually give you some insights that it maybe would require some work to prove that something can be done in polynomial time, but just by the very fact that you can express it in a certain logic, that gives it to you for free. Uh, but what I'm really interested in this talk is uh, about logics like this, but not over arbitrary structures like arbitrary graphs, but over so graph structures which are very structured. So things like words or trees. So that would be my third example. Let's have it here. So suppose that you want to uh, express, you have trees where the, the vertices are red or black, and you want a property of these trees. So for example, uh, describe those trees where no leaf is colored red. Okay, so since I assume here that uh, uh, red or black are the only two available colors, uh, I could say every, every leaf is black. So you can use the formula in the same spirit as in the previous examples. So we could say for every, for every node x which is red, so I have a unary predicate here which is the node is red, there is uh, something below it so it's not a leaf. Okay, I hope this formula is correct. I try to keep them short and write the natural language above it so that I'm uh, <laughs> immune to errors. Uh, and these are the type of things that I would be mainly interested in this talk. So using logics, and I will explain what kinds of logics, to express properties of words and trees. And since over words and trees you can run automata, then you can ask about the connection between these logics and automata, <coughs> and that is what I will be talking about. So it's a, it's a very classic theme in the study of, 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 of logic in computer science, which is the connect, which is words or logics over things like words and trees and how they connect to automata, and this is what I would like to talk about. Okay, so that's the type of logic. Logic on words and trees, and this is the topic of, of my talk. Okay, so let's go to the connection with automata. Uh, I wanted to introduce an automaton, but I don't think I'll do it anyway. So what's an automaton? <coughs> let's start off with a basic type of automaton, an automaton over words. So if you haven't seen an automaton here, it is. It looks like this. I will use the convention here that red states are accepting just to keep you awake. Uh, and you have an initial state here. 
and then you use it to, uh, to read a word. So you input a word, and then the, this device will just say yes or no, and the way it does so, so suppose that your word is this, then what you do is you start in the initial state at the beginning of the word, and then you ask, you know, I am here, this is my input letter, so what should I do? Well, this automaton says I should stay here. So I, I read one input symbol and I continue to be here. Then I ask, what should I do here? Well, do this. So it will move here and then make a self loop and you know continue doing so until you reach the end of the word. And in this particular case, I end up in a state which is, uh, which is not, not accepting, so the word is rejected. So that, that's an automaton. Now the beauty of automata is that you can gen this concept is incredibly robust and you can generalize it to infinite things, to, inf to, uh, to trees and also maybe even to graphs in some cases. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very robust concept. In my talk I will be mainly talking about finite words and finite trees. Okay? Uh, so that's an automaton and now about the connection with logic, if I want to talk about the connection with logic, then I will state three very simple observations about automata, and that will be my basis for making the connection with logic. So these are three simple observations about automata. So what are two, three closure properties of, of all regular languages? Uh, uh, number one, if I have two regular lang languages, then I take the intersection or the union that is also going to be regular. And the way you can prove it is at least I will try to entertain you with animation if you haven't seen it before. So this is, say, one automaton, and this is over one letter alphabet, so it just accepts words which says that the length is divisible by three. And then you have another automaton such that this is also over one letter alphabet, so I don't put labels here. This will accept words such that the length is at least three. And if I want to say, take, take their union, then that will be words which have length divisible by three or have length at least three. Uh, we'll see what that gives. So the way you do it is you take a product of these two automata. Okay? So you take an automaton such that the state of this product automaton is a pair of states. So it's going to be a rectangle, which you will look like this. And with the arrows being done in the natural way. So if I'm in a state here, then I... Uh, I make a step in both automata and I see where I end up. And since I'm doing in this particular case a union, then I take this and that because it's or. So that's the uh, construction for taking the union of two regular, proves that if I have two regular languages, then their union is regular and the same thing works for intersection, but you just need to choose the accepting state to be on this one. Okay? Uh, another uh, simple observation is that if you have uh, a language recognized by an automaton, then the complement of that language, so it's, it says you swap yes with no, is also going to be recognized by an automaton. And the way you show it is that, uh, for example, if your automaton happens to be deterministic, as is the case for this particular picture, uh, then you just complement the accepting states. And that gives you an automaton which says yes, which switches between yes and no. So that's how you do complementation. And then there's a final construction which I will call guessing. And this is maybe the most important one. And it is uh, uh, the following one. Suppose I have an automaton here over a two-letter alphabet. So this automaton, I don't know what it does, uh, some property over words of words over alphabet AB. Now what you could imagine is that you uh, have a function from A to B to C, well, there is only one possibility for such a function, and you get a word over this alphabet C. And now what you want to know, given a word over the alphabet C, is it possible to come back across this function? Now, there's many different ways, because for every different letter, you could choose A or B. So if your word has length n, then there's two to the n possibilities for that. And you want to know, given a word over alphabet C, can it be lifted to a word over alphabet AB, which is accepted by this optimal? So that would be the image of the language recognized by this automaton under this function. And that's what I would call guessing here. And the way you do it is you use non-determinism. Now it is my great honor to, to have in the audience one of the persons who invented non-determinism over there, Dana Scott. So it's uh, another reason to be stressed about giving this talk. 
So what, what you do is uh, you just take this exact same automaton, but to every label that appears in it, you apply the function f. So in this particular case, uh, you will have c's everywhere. Now the thing is that this was deterministic. So if you were here and you, let a, you, you, you had a letter a or b, you would know exactly which state you would be in. But by up doing this, you end up with a non-deterministic automaton because, for example, here when you read C, you could either do this or do that. But this automaton has the property that accepts a word if and only if it could, it is the image of some word accepted by this. That's what I would call guessing. Okay. Now, if we use this guessing construction, then we will tra transform a deterministic automaton into one which is non-deterministic. If we wanted to use complementation, we required a uh, deterministic automaton. Therefore, if you want to do guessing followed by complementation, the obvious way to do it would be to first introduce non-determinism and then determinize, which would result in an exponential blow up. And this is in general unavoidable because if you iterate these things n times, the, auto the, the, the automaton might grow up, blow up non-elementarily and provably so. So that's uh, an un unavoidable thing. <coughs> so these are three basic properties of regular languages, and the reason why I mention them is that they look very close to logic. So this looks like the positive Boolean connectives, and and or, this looks like negation. And this, as you will see, looks ex the same thing as an existential quantifier, which given the C's, guesses the subset of positions which had A. And this observation that these automata look like logic is formalized in the, f well, will be formalized in a moment in a theorem, which I will illustrate first by an example. So let's consider uh, this formula. Uh, so it's a formula which inputs a word, okay? And what it's going to say is that the word has even length. And how does this formula do it? Well, you say that a word has even length, or I think odd length, actually this is odd length, if there exists a set of positions in the word which contains every other position, so it, the set of positions alternates between yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So he says yes to the first position and says no to the last position. That's a roundabout way of expressing that a word has odd, odd <coughs> length. Okay? But what you see here is that this is expressed in the type of logic that we described before, and actually the logic that you do it in is called monadic second order logic, so I will explain now what that means. It is a special case of second order logic, uh, but uh, I will just say what, what, what you're allowed to do. So what you're allowed to do is you can quantify over sets of positions. Now remember, in second order logic, you, could be al you would be allowed to quantify over sets of pairs of positions or sets of triples of positions. This is not the case here. That's why it's called monadic. So this means sets over of individual positions as opposed to sets of pairs. But second order means you're allowed to quantify over sets. It would be third order if it would be sets of sets, but that's also not the case here, okay? The other thing you can do is you can quantify over individual positions, which I encode by writing the small, small case letters and big letters. You can talk about the order of positions because we're, we're dealing with words, and that implicit, that also accounts for uh, successor, which can be defined in terms of order. And in general, you can also talk about labels of positions because you want to express a property of a word which might have an alphabet like A, B, C. So you might want to ask if a position has label A, B, or C. But this is not witnessed in this particular example, but in general, you're allowed to do it. So you can talk about labels of positions. So that's monadic second order logic. A formula which is built using these operations and which is used to express a property of a word, such as having odd length as in this example. Okay? Now, Here's the theorem, uh, which is technically quite simple, but it's, I think, a very deep theorem. Uh, well, deep theorem. Although not, you know, to prove it, it doesn't take too much time, but it's, it's very influential. The following conditions are equivalent for a language of finite words. It is recognized by a finite automaton, or it is defined, and, and the equivalent condition defined with monadic second. And uh, the reason for this, that the more interesting part, and the one that I have, I think, argued here, is that how do you go from a finite automaton, uh, from a formula of monadic second order logic to a finite automaton, you use these closure properties. 
because this corresponds to guessing, this corresponds to intersection. Then if you want to have universal quantifiers, you use complementation, you get all of the connectives of the logic. Okay. Uh, so that, that is the general idea. This was a theorem that was proved originally by, uh, independently in the early 60s, I believe, by Büchi, Elgott, and Trachtenbrot, uh, uh, which showed that it's kind of natural because it, was, uh, it appeared in, in, in three different places at the same time. And uh, it works for other things as well. Now, it will work for whatever notion you have different than finite words. So for example, infinite words or trees or something, as long as you can come up with an automaton model that is closed under intersection and union, complementation and guessing, then this will work for you. So a typical way to do it is to have Automata uh, have a non-deterministic and deterministic automata. Non-determinism allows you to take care of that. And uh, determinism allows you to take care of that. And as long as the two models are equivalent, then you can alternate between guessing and complementation. So this theorem has been proved, for example, for infinite words, infinite words by Büchi. So there are, there are uh, th this is true. Also, and a famous result is, is by Rabin. Uh, which says that this works for infinite trees as well. Also works for finite trees, where finite trees is not so hard to prove. For example, for infinite trees, there is no determinization known, and that means, I mean, it's not, not possible in a certain precise sense, uh, and therefore one has to deal with complementation without you doing determinization, but th that can be done. It's a technically uh, very interesting construction. So uh, there is also some work by Courcel and others afterwards for graphs. Now I would like to uh, not oversell this because it's essentially about trees which pretend to be graphs. So it's typically about graphs of bounded tree width for graphs of bounded clique width. Um, and then it, it's still interesting, but it really is about trees somehow. Okay. So that's, that's the field of... Uh, that's the automata and logic connection. So the, the observation that formulas of a certain logic have the exact same power as, uh, as automata. And this uh, uh, one corollary of this, and these constructions are effective. If you want to go from an automaton to a logic formula, then these are, there are algorithms which do that, although they're not very efficient, uh, which is an understatement. Uh, uh, but that gives you, uh, for example, if you have a, a, f a formula of monadic second order logic and you want to know, does there exist uh, a, wor a finite word, for example, where it's true, then you can transform that formula into an automaton, which takes an incredible amount of time, but finite time. And then you can ask if that automaton is empty, which does not take so much time. Uh, that's the automata field. But what I'm mainly interested, what I would mainly like to tell you about in this particular talk is the connection of algebra. So algebraic automata theory. So the idea is, instead of using automata, use algebras. And I will try to argue that this, is a, this leads to, to some interesting insights. Again, most of these ideas have been around for quite some time, but there is some steady progress. And at the end, I hope to at least give you some results that are less than 50 years old. Uh, so algebra. Uh, Let's, uh, in my presentation of algebra, I would like to focus on the notion of a compositional function. The reason I do it, instead of a monoid, which will appear eventually, this is a way of presenting monoids, is that this, in my opinion, is more robust and it extends to different settings than finite words and so on. So let me define a compositional function. So what's a, composi a, function comp a compositional function? A candidate for a compositional function is something which inputs words and produces elements from some set. Now, this is not the only notion of compositionality. This is compositional function from words to something. You could have compositional functions from trees to something. You could have compositional functions from the syntax of a programming language to something, and so on. So this is just one type of compositionality. And let me define it this way. So the slogan is that the function is compositional if the value of the function on a bigger part is determined by the values of the function on smaller parts. That's the slogan. So let, let me make this slogan precise uh, as follows. So suppose I have <coughs> one part, a word. Let's say that this word is called beginning. Okay? 
And then I have another part, which is a, a second word, and this one happens to have three letters and be the word end. Okay? Now what I could do is, I could first combine these two parts into a bigger word. That's the, this is the whole, and these are the parts. And then apply the function. Another thing that I could do is I could apply the function to the parts, okay, getting some element of the set M. So now I have the ingredients for the slogan. I have the value on the whole, and I have the values on the parts. And now I can say that this can be uniquely determined from this and that, and what that means is that there's a function. This is a two-argument operation. It inputs two arguments, this and that, and produces that, which makes this incomplete. That will be compositional. If you can manage to find something which does that. So the red arrows, technically speaking, they are some operation which take the value on the first part, the value on the second part, and they tell you what is going to be the value on the entire thing. So that's what I would define to be a compositional function. And it so happens that such a compositional function will turn M into something called a monoid. So for those of you who have seen it, this is, the, this, is the, this is true. I mean, as long as the function f was surjective. And it's also going to turn the original function into a homomorphism. And actually, homomorphisms uh, uh, from this to a monoid, and actually this could be any monoid as well, are the same thing as compositional functions, the way defined this way. So if you don't like to talk about monoids, you can use compositional functions, the same kind of notion. So that's a compositional function. And I can only, and a very important example of a compositional function, and this will explain the, I hope, explain the significance of monadic second order logic, is the following function. So let's fix some k. The, the idea is this, this is going to be the quantifier rank, I will explain in a second. Well, I will explain right now. The quantifier rank of a formula, if you view a formula as a tree where the syntax tree, then the quantifier rank is the greatest number of quantifiers you see on any path. So fix some quantifier rank, and then it turns out that the following function is compositional. I input a word, and then I map this word to the sentences of monadic second order logic, which are true in that word, restricted to quantifier rank k. That's a function. It assigns to every word a certain set of sentences. In general, infinite because you can, you know, uh, write the same sentence of quantifier rank k in infinitely many different ways. But one can show is that there's actually finitely many possible values. This is not a very difficult thing to do. It has been known for quite some uh, there's, uh, uh, there's finitely many possible values. And as the theorem says, this is a compositional function. And therefore, as I mentioned, compositional functions are the same thing as homomorphisms into monoids. So actually what we're dealing with here is a monoid homomorphism from all words to this kind of monoid, which happens to be a finite monoid. So this theorem is essentially the buchy trachtenbrot elgott theorem, because it tells you that finite monoids and monadic second-order logic, well, at least it gives you the interesting direction. You go from, from monadic second-order logic to a finite monoid. And I would like to argue, in this particular case, uh, to what is the significance of monadic second order logic. So here's a sketch of a proof uh, for this theorem. And it's just like one thing that, uh, well, it's a sketch. So the op key observation is that if you have a f formula of monadic second order logic, what it does is, you know, it guesses, it existentially quantifies over a set. So, you know, but we want to show that it's compositional. So maybe this word is comp decomposed into the first half and the second half. Now, the key observation is that a set here, choosing a set here, is the same thing as choosing what the set is restricted to here and the set restricted to here. So it's sort of like nicely decomposes. So if I want to say choose a set here, all I have to say is the same thing as saying what is the part on the right side, what is the part on the left side. Now, the reason why I say this is that you will see here that this is true for a set of positions but it's not true for a set of pairs of positions. Because if you want to choose a set of pairs of positions in a word, then it's not enough to say what is that set of pairs restricted to the first half and what is that set of pairs restricted to the second half because you're ignoring the information about pairs which live between here and here. That's why the theorem will not work for 
second order logic, uh, general second order logic as opposed to monadic second order logic. Uh, so this is, this is the, uh, the algebraic view on, on logic and you can sum it up in the following theorem that uh, for every la language being recognized by finite automaton, being definable by in monadic second order logic are the same thing, this we have seen already and now we can add a third condition which says that you're recognized by a homomorphism into a finite monoid and this is essentially the proof is here because this is the homomorphism that you need if you want to recognize a property which has quantifier rank k. Uh, the reason why I tried to restate this theorem, uh, let me forget that. Okay, may let me explain, I, maybe I didn't say exactly what it means to recognize a, 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 recognize a language by a homomorphism, but that means that if I want to recognize a language by homomorphism, what it means is the following thing. I have the language which I can view as a function, Triton puts a word and says yes or no, and then I will say that a homomorphism like this recognizes it if it has more than enough information to say yes or no. And what that technically means is that you can choose an accepting set, so a function which, which inputs an element of the monoid and says yes or no. So it's That's what it means to recognize. Mm -hmm. Now the reason why I stated this theorem is that uh, if we now, uh, now we can uh, use algebraic properties of monoids to, uh, to, to describe other logics. So here's the, what I think is maybe my, my, my own personal uh, favorite theorem. Let's forget this for a moment, which is the following. Let's ask the, the following question. In this theorem, I discussed monadic second order logic. So in monadic second order logic, you can quantify over sets of positions. What if you consider a weaker logic called first order logic when you can only value, quantify over individual positions? What is the expressive power of that? And here's a very beautiful theorem which says that uh, for a language L being definable in first order logic that is using only quantification over individual position, positions is exactly the same thing. Here in general for MSO, monadic second order logic, you use an arbitrary finite monoid but if you want to correspond to first order logic, then you have to use a group free finite monoid. And that, what that means is that a finite monoid which does not contain any subset which is isomorphic to a group. Uh, the group does not need to have the same identity as the monoid. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, a, I mean, you be the judge, but I think it's a remarkable theorem because it connects two very natural concepts which do not seem to be related at all at first sight, but turn out indeed related and uh, yeah so that would be one motivation to use uh, algebra instead of automata because in monoids you have a lot of uh, you know algebraic notions that you could exploit the notions of a group and so on which are uh, less visible uh, in an automata I will continue discussing this right now and well let me ask the question what is the advantage what do you gain by using monoids instead of automata so one advantage we had was this Schuttenberger theorem which used groups to characterize first order logic and in that direction you can make the following observation. Here's the main reason I think to use monoids is that unlike automata, finite, automa finite monoids have a structure theory. If you have an automaton there's not really too much structure that you can, it's essentially a graph and there's not much structure and there is some but uh, you can you know decompose it into connected components or something, but there's not much that is known to be doable. However, for a finite monoid, it, 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 you can do much more. So I will mention a, a theorem, a Berkeley theorem by Cron Rhodes, uh, or two people, uh, which says the following thing. As an example of structure theory of finite monoids, every finite monoid can be decomposed into a product of monoids such that every element of this product is either a finite group, and finite groups are classified, uh, or it is one fixed non-group monoid. Uh, it has three elements, it's called U2, and it corresponds to words that end with A, over a, an alphabet of two letters A and B. So, it's, uh, yeah. so what this theorem says is that you have either groups or really nothing much. Now I would have to say exactly what it means to, 
what this product operation is, this is something called the reef product, is the idea is that like one monoid reads the results of a previous monoid and what it, does it mean to decompose and what that means is that every monoid uh, is a homomorphic image of a submonoid of that. But this theorem, it, it really gives you quite a lot of insight into the structure of any monoid. And that's, that's very nice and you cannot really do that uh, with, uh, with automata because there's no structural decompositions for automata, as I said. Not, 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 no, no really useful ones. I will give you another example of structure theory monoids uh, with a slight connection to algorithms in the following slide. So to inspire it, let's consider the following naive data structure. Suppose that we want to check if a word has an even number of A's. The data structure I will use is maybe not the smartest data structure to do it, but it's supposed to you know, motivate the, the later ones. And well, this corresponds, so here's a word, and you know, I want to see if it has an even number of A's. In this particular case, it has three A's, so the answer is no. What this corresponds to is that I have a homomorphism from all possible words to the uh, two-element additive field. Addition is mo mo modulo, modulo two. Now, one thing I could do, a very naive data structure, is the following thing. So I first compute the value of this homomorphism for every individual letter. So A's are one and B's are zero because here there's an odd number of A's and here there's an even number of A's because there's no A's. And now I can just do divide and conquer so I can group it you know, into an uh, exp exponential way. So I group it here. And then I can multiply one and zero, well add one and zero and get one and so on. And then I can continue doing so. Get a tree of logarithmic depth. So that's a very naive data structure uh, to do that. And for example, one advantage of this data structure is that uh, if I, for example, change a label here, then uh, I don't need to, to modify too many things because I just need to propagate the changed values up. And that requires a logarithmic number of changes. So this uh, data, naive data structure is supposed to be an inspiration for something which is more fancy and uses the uh, structural uh, theory of monoids. Namely, this tree has logarithmic depth, which is okay, but it's not constant. Now what you can do is you can have, in a certain sense, constant depth. So I will explain this in a moment. Uh, so I start out the same way as previously. So I have for every position its value in the monoid. I will use the example of the two element field. And now I can combine things. Now there's going to be two rules for combining things. Rule number one is I can combine two things. That's, that's the rule I had previously and well if you only have that rule then you're going to necessarily need a logarithmic number of steps and it's not going to be constant. Uh, but there's another rule which says if I have several consecutive elements which all happen to have the same data value then I can combine them together in one step. Okay, so I have arbitrary fan in here, not necessarily two, as long as all of my results have exact same value, which in this example is zero. And to evaluate that, you don't need too much time because you just need to know what is that value and how many there are. And then you just, that's all the information you need. And these are the only two rules we have. So I can combine two things or I can combine an arbitrary number of things as long as they're consecutive and they have the same value. So I could continue. Now I think here I will do the binary rule. I combine two different things. And now what I have is I look at the things which are left and they all happen to have the same value one so I can combine them all together in one step. So having these two possible rules, in principle I could have much shallower trees because I can have a lot of things like this. And it is indeed the case, so there's a theorem of Imre Shimon, which says that you can always find such a tree with depth which is three times the size of the monoid. Note that the length of the word does not appear here at all. Okay, so in that sense, it's constant depth. You can argue about, you know, what are the benefits of that. I mean, you know, maybe log of any number is at most 50 anyway. So, uh, and monoids of size, such that of size 50 over three are, small monoids, but uh, 
But it, it is, I think, of theoretical interest. And to prove this, you really need to go into the structural theory uh, of, of monoids and how their their ideal structure and stuff like that. So one example application of this result is something that uh, we proved together with Pavel Paris that a logic called XPath, which is used in XML, uh, this is a, it's, 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 it's a query language which is used to uh, describe properties of XML files such as web pages, and uh, it is it's, 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 it's an important component of it is a component of every browser, and then uh, the, the, the previously known uh, algorithm would run in, say, quadratic time, and now you can improve this to, to linear time in the size of the, of the document by using this constant, uh, constant depth thing. So that's uh, one thing. There's other applications of that as well. This is, uh, I think, a very beautiful theory. So these are the advantages of using algebra instead of uh, automata because you have a certain structural theory that you can exploit. And therefore, uh, if you want a take-home message, if at some point you end up dealing with a property of words, then I recommend uh, to, that you try to see if uh, you can abstract it away as a property of monoids using a compositional function, which is very often the case, and then hope to use, for example, this theorem by Shimon which, uh, which is, I think, uh, in, in many cases, is a helpful thing. The last thing that I would want to talk about in uh, my talk is tr algebra for trees. So, so far it was about words, and now the last example I would uh, try to use is, is, is uh, of, of trees. So the first the question is, you know, what's an algebra for trees? What's the algebraic structure that corresponds to monoids? Now, there's a lot of different candidates, and each one ha of them has their uh, particular virtues. Uh, the one that I will focus on here is an algebraic structure called an algebra, okay? uh, which is the, the most classical one available. Uh, so uh, let me explain this in a moment. So suppose that we have uh, an alphabet. Now, if we're talking about trees, every letter has an arity. So this is a, you could do it different ways, but this is one way to do it also known as a signature. So you have a letter of RT2, a letter of RT1, and a letter of a, a constant. And now you construct trees from that. So whenever you use A, you have to have two children, and so on. also called terms. Okay? And now uh, that, that would be what a tree is. Now, uh, trees or terms have a natural algebraic structure uh, in the following sense. So let's use this definition from universal algebra, which says that an algebra period, uh, just the end of the name, uh, is a set with some operations on it. That's it. That's an extremely uh, general and simple definition. Now, one would expect not to get anything out of a def definition as general as this, but at the last slide, I would try to argue that you can get something out of it. Okay? So you just have uh, uh, a, a set with some operations. By an operation, I mean like, for example, a binary operation which takes two elements from here and produces one element from here, or a ternary operation which takes three elements from here and produces one element from here, or, or a zero error operation which is a constant. That's, a, that's what I mean by operations here. Okay? Now, uh, for example, the set of all trees over, for example, this alphabet can be viewed as an algebra. The set is the trees. And you have a binary operation A, which inputs two trees and produces a bigger tree by you know, combining them. You have a unary operation B, which inputs one tree and attaches B to the top. And you have a constant C, which just produces this single tree. It's a natural way to view it as a, an algebra. And then what you could use is you could use a homomorphism of algebras. So what is that? So a homomorphism of algebras is, uh, well, each algebra has two sources, the underlying set and the operations. Here's the underlying set and the operation, and a homomorph is what you would expect it to be. So you map every element from here to some element here, and you map every operation here to some operation here with the same arity in a way which is consistent. So that if you first apply it here and then apply an operation over there, it's the same thing as you apply the operation here and then went there. So that's a homomorphism of algebras. And then we could uh, define a regular language of trees, and this coincides with what people typically call regular language of trees, uh, to be anything that's recognized by a homomorphism such that this algebra is finite, so the universe is finite. 
This is the notion of regular tree line, which it corresponds to. It uh, extends regularity from words to trees. Now, what I wanted to say is this. If you have a definition like this, you would say, oh, this is ridiculous. I mean, you can't, you can't get anything out of it. I mean, on this level of generality, you cannot really prove anything. And this is not the case. So it so happens that even on this level of generality, you can have non-trivial structural theorems. And I would like to mention one of them, and that will be the end of my talk. So let me mention the structural <coughs> theorem. Uh, so, which will mm, sort of indicate a positive answer to this question. Uh, this is not something that I'm very well familiar with, but uh, a little bit, but uh, I hope in sufficiently to, to explain what's going on. Uh, so, uh, to, illust to, to illustrate the, the definitions in, in this structural theorem, uh, consider this example. Suppose we have a one algebra, which is the two element Boolean algebra, so the set is 0, 1, and you have the three Boolean operations. As another example of an algebra, uh, you can have the same underlying set, yes or no, plus the NAND operation. And I looked up on the internet that you're supposed to draw it like this. And uh, this is well known that the NAND operation is complete. So you can express all of these things using NAND. And likewise, well, this is also complete. You can express NAND using these things. And let's write wh what does that mean. So for example, if you want to do negation, then you write a little NAND of x with a 1. I hope this is the correct thing. And if you want to do uh, AND, then you just do NAND, and then you negate it. And uh, you know, if you want to do NAND, then you just date the definition. The reason why I wrote out this is to illustrate the definition of a polynomial. So in universal algebra, a little tree like this is called a polynomial. So a polynomial, in this case, this is a polynomial over that algebra, is a little tree which uses the operations from the algebra. It uses variables, and it is allowed to use any constant you wish. Okay? So you, uh, any element from the underlying set as a constant. That, that's a polynomial. In general, this is not maybe visible in my picture. You can use variables several times, or zero times as well. That, that's also allowed. That's a polynomial. So what we have shown is that every operation here can be expressed by a polynomial here. And conversely, so every operation here, there's only one, can be expressed by a polynomial here. And that is the name that is what we call two algebras with polynomial equivalent. That's the definition. Two algebras are polynomial equivalent if every operation in one can be expressed via a polynom polynomial in the other, and conversely, so. In other words, the polynomials in the algebras are exactly the same. So in, in particular, for this to happen, you need to have the exact same universe or up to isomorphism. Okay. So that's polynomial equivalence. Now here's a theorem uh, which was proved by Palfi, and I think it's crazy. So suppose that you have a finite algebra. Now this is not, a, it does not apply to any finite algebra. It needs to satisfy a certain property. I will, I will try to talk about a bit about this property in a second, which says that every uni unary polynomial, so it's a polynomial which takes only one variable x, maybe uses it several times and combines it with constants. Happens, so if you have a unary polynomial that gives you a function from the universe of the algebra to the universe of the algebra. And properties, the assumption of this theorem that every unary polynomial either maps everybody to a single element or is a permutation of the universe. You might think, well, <laughs> no algebras satisfy this property. Uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Now, if you believe me for a moment that this is a reasonable assumption, then the conclusion is extremely beautiful. Because the conclusion says that every algebra like this is polynomially equivalent to one of the following things. Number one, the Boolean algebra. So if it, number two, the Boolean, the positive Boolean, the monotone operations. Number three, uh, not all monotone operations, but only intersections. Now, this is up to isomorphism. So if you have only union, then you're polynomial equivalent to this by just taking the isomorphism which maps 0 to 1. Okay? So s these are three examples. And it's where it's already, we've already done 60%. So another one is this. A finite vector space over a finite field. What does that mean? So suppose you have a finite vector space uh, over a finite field. You can view it as an algebra in the following way. 
uh, the elements of the algebra, the universe is the vector space. You have one binary operation plus as in a vector space for adding vectors. And for every element of the finite field, you have one operation multiplied by mean. Okay, that's the multiplication by scalars. That's how you view a finite vector space over a finite field as an algebra. And you can get this as a result. And the one last thing that you're left with is a group acting on a finite set. So this is an algebra which is obtained. You take a group which acts on a finite set and you view it as an algebra in the sense that the universe of the algebra is this finite set being acted upon. And uh, and you have just unary operations, nothing else, which correspond to this group. And then, yeah, that, 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 that's the only thing you have. So uh, here you don't have any operations which, uh, which depend on more than one uh, coordinate. And now the theorem says that these are the only things that you can get. So you have only five possibilities, and there's even in universal algebra, there's a classical numbering. I don't know why this one, but it's, uh, they always say algebra number three or type number four or something. You have to learn this. And that's the theory. That's the end of the theory. So it says that assuming this star thing, then uh, you have this. And this is a non-trivial theorem. It's not, uh, not, not so easy to prove. And it's like some algebra results. You just have no idea where this, I, where this came from. And it's like pages and pages of completely arbitrary decisions which end up with something like this. Now, I would like to comment about this. And uh, I, I said that it looks like a ridiculous assumption, and don't take my word for it, take Palfi's word for it. Uh, because uh, and I talked to him, I said, oh, this is a crazy theory. And he goes, yeah, I mean, uh, 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 he says uh, that when he started to work on this, uh, uh, his colleague Pavel Pudlak told him to, uh, to, to, to try to classify algebras which satisfy property star. And he said, but this property doesn't make any sense, but you know, I. I I, I, I tried to do it anyway because Pudlak told me to do it. And, uh, and he did it. But what turns out later, in later developments, this is, uh, and so th these are, I think, Berkeley developments, uh, it turns out that property star is kind of important. So in something that this, this theorem, I would say, I, I would guess, is a point of something called Tain Congruence theory, which is a structural theory of finite algebras which was developed in, uh, by, mainly by Mackenzie in the 80s, which classifies all finite algebras in a certain way, mainly the congruences in them. And, and, but it, uh, it, 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 it says, has something to say about every algebra. And what they show is, I mean, the beginning of this is that if you take an algebra, a finite algebra, and then you take two congruences in it, and they're neighboring congruence, congruence and there's nothing in between them. So every, since it's a finite algebra, every two congruences can be you know, connected by a chain of uh, uh, neighboring ones. Then to such a pair of neighboring congruences, you can uniquely associate an algebra in a, in a natural and canonical way which satisfies property star. And to that algebra, you can apply the Palfi theorem and therefore associate to it one of these numbers, one, two, three, four, five. And uh, that gives you a, a quite a lot of information and this theorem, uh, this theory, ten congruence theory, uh, based on this, has been, for example, uh, instrumental in, in recent uh, progress on classifying constraint satisfaction problems. Uh, so, uh, which maybe even they actually, possibly it has already been solved using methods like this. So what I wanted to say in this example is that even for arbitrary algebras, there is a structural theory and you can try to use it to get some benefit from that. Uh, so I think that's all I wanted to say. So uh, my message is that uh, often instead of if you have logic and you want to use automata, sometimes it's a good idea instead of using automata to use algebra because there you have a richer structure or theory and that allows you to make some maybe interesting observations. So that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you.
Yes. So uh, up to isomorphs. So the, the first thing that you do in the Parfi theorem is say maybe the universe has two elements. And there it's not so difficult to prove that you have five possible cases. Or six, I don't remember. Three of them on that list. Uh, then it gets interesting because what you show is that if he has more than two elements, then you necessarily end up in one of these two cases of vector spaces and, and group actions. And that's where the non-trivial math I'm not sure. Uh, th that's a very, very interesting question. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm not currently aware of such things, but I do think that what you can get is inspirations for algebraic problems. So uh, uh, you can uh, uh, end up discovering, uh, maybe not proving, but discovering concepts in algebra motivated by logic. And there are examples of that. So there are products product operations in algebra that are uh, inspired by uh, connectives in logic, for example. So in that sense, you have transfer in the other way. 